This is going to be pretty shocking for some of you. There is a dividing line in the book of Romans. This changes our understanding of the golden chain of redemption and who the elect are. Romans is actually a letter of reconciliation between the Jew and the Gentile believers. And those whom he called, these he also justified. Those whom he justified, these he also glorified. The Roman church at this time transitioned from predominantly a Jewish church, now mainly to a Gentile church, after the expulsion of the Jews. You can not break this chain as Paul writes it. Welcome back to our session five of this all-important study of two-part Romans. I trust you have viewed all four of the previous sessions. In our last session, we reviewed the first three chapters of Romans with two main objectives. Our first objective was to find places that Paul wrote separately to the Jews. And our second objective was to find other places where Paul wrote separately to the Gentiles. We will continue with this same two objectives as we pick up now with the last four verses of chapter three of the book of Romans. As a reminder, first, this study is based on the book written by Brent Lay, and I have placed a link so that you can purchase a copy of that book on Amazon. Please allow me to clarify again that our task at hand is not teaching or preaching Bible lessons, nor is it systematizing doctrine. I have great appreciation for those functions, but that is not the task before us in this study. Our sole task is to provide evidence through proper exegesis that Paul wrote the book of Romans in two parts. Paul wrote first to the Jews in the first eight chapters, and then he wrote to the Gentiles in the latter eight chapters. As stated in earlier sessions, the diagnostic tool, which is essential, is that of proper exegesis. The word exegesis originates from the Greek word exgemi, which means to lead out. The Bible was written over a time period of at least 1700 years by more than 40 authors. The Bible is a book of books. Each book was written in a different setting and at a different time. If one proceeds immediately into Greek word studies or comparisons with verses from other epistles, that person is skipping over the beginning point of proper exegesis. We must be very careful to rightly divide God's word. Some of the first steps of proper exegesis involve the steps as listed here. As mentioned before, we are using the approach as recommended by Dr. Gordon Fee and described in his best-selling textbook, Exegesis. Dr. Fee advised that we should use at least seven translations when observing problematic verses or sections of scripture. And we will continue to use nine translations. Dr. Fee also instructed that we need to look for patterns throughout the letter. He encouraged students to ask questions like, what relation do the recipients have with the author? What is the purpose of the author? What unusual vocabulary occurs? Our goal is to discover the original intent of the author. Many of you have been trained in inductive Bible study and know this is the correct method for a true Bible study. A wrong way is to begin with someone's commentary. The Bereans described in Acts 17 were searching or examining the scriptures daily for themselves. That is exactly what I'm asking you to do. 
In the case of Romans, proper exegesis begins with looking over the entirety of the letter or epistle. We are diligently searching for patterns and clues that will help us understand Paul's original intent. Like arriving upon a crime scene, we must be diligent not to miss any evidence. Again, this is a wonderful time to pick up your pen and your paper, as well as your Bible or a printed out translation. Since my debate opponent, James White, has endorsed the Legacy Standard Bible, I will continue to primarily use that translation. And most of you know that is the translation promoted by John MacArthur. I think you will find it helpful to print off these chapters of Romans on paper so that you can mark it up as we continue. I have a brand new resource I also just listed in the description box of the video that you can purchase and can help you study along. Many of you have already put to practice Dr. Gordon Fee's advice about reading through the book of Romans several times on successive days. And in doing this, many of you have noticed a few key patterns. As we begin, I will be sharing with you five overall observations. Number one is note the connectivity of Paul's writing. We can see this by observing the abundance of transitional words and phrases in chapters four through eight. Let us take a quick look. Almost every verse begins with a transition. In total, there are 112 verses. Is this not amazing? Paul seems to barely take a breath. Secondly, note the consistency of Paul's defined audience. We can easily observe that Paul is primarily identifying personally with his audience. Paul writes using an abundance of first person plural pronouns. So see the chart here, Paul identifies with his audience, first person plural, we 53 times, our 18 times, 88 times total, us 17 times, and then they 16 times, them 11 times, 27 times total. Why is this important? This clearly substantiates that Paul as a Jew of Jews continually identifies with his fellow Jews, saying we more than 53 times. A third overall observation is this. Paul explicitly defined his audience six times in the first eight chapters. Each of the following verses leaves no doubt. Chapter two, verse one. Oh man, as R.C. Sproul explained, was a Jew in session four. Number two, chapter 317, you bear the name Jew. 324, blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, speaking to the Jews. Chapter four, verse one, our forefather according to the flesh. Chapter seven, verse one, for I am speaking to those who know the law. We know that is a reference to the Jews. Chapter eight, verse 23, for we ourselves having the first fruits of the spirit, speaking of Pentecost, the Jews had the first fruits of the spirit as we see in Acts chapter two. How could Paul have made it more clear? Paul is writing exclusively to his fellow Jews. And by the way, take a guess as to how many times Paul explicitly writes the phrase, I am speaking to Gentiles in the first eight chapters. 
If you guess zero, you are correct, because absolutely nowhere does he say this. This is not my opinion. This is just fact. Examine the verses for yourselves. Allow me to say this slowly. These first eight chapters are dripping with Jewishness. Paul is writing to Jews about Jews. Think about it. Paul had been preaching to Gentiles for years. He was the renowned apostle to the Gentiles. He had been on three missionary journeys, traveling thousands of miles with hundreds, if not thousands of Gentile conversions. He knew plenty of wonderful examples of Gentiles following Christ. Paul could have used many. And remember, Gentiles would have been great examples of people being saved without works or deeds. So we have an obvious question before us. How many Gentiles does Paul refer to in these first eight chapters? How many? Paul mentions none. Paul does not refer to even one Gentile by name. Don't you think that's an astonishing observation? Does anyone even suggest that Paul, the great scholar, just forgot to provide a Gentile example? Is this not a fair question to ask? If Paul is writing to Gentiles, why did Paul not use at least one Gentile example? I think most of us realize the answer to the question. Paul was not writing to Gentiles in these eight chapters. Paul was driving the truth home to his fellow Jews. And as you all well know, in these chapters, Paul illustrated with two of the greatest heroes of the Jewish faith. His two featured examples were Abraham, the forefather of the flesh, and David, who by Jewish tradition was the greatest king the Jews had. David, of course, was of the very lineage of the long-awaited Messiah of the Jews. These are foundational observations that cannot be denied. I am not making this up. Please put these three observations in your notes. I will share a fourth and a fifth observation in just a few moments. So with these first three overall observations in mind, let us proceed looking at the text. In our last session, we focused on chapters one through three. We landed on 31 points of evidence. The score was 31 to none that Paul wrote to the Jews, not to Gentiles in the first three chapters. And think about that, 31 to none. 31 points of evidence to zero in the first three chapters. In our commitment to proper exegesis, let us continue to weigh the evidence by observing the text and allow the text to speak for itself. Look with me beginning in the 29th verse of chapter 3, where we left off. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also we see that the next few verses actually connect with chapter 4. Remember, Dr. Fee made a point that the original chapter divisions are not original to the text. Paul has stated clearly that he concludes an argument in verse 28. As pointed out earlier, Paul is writing very intensely and continuously. It is like he hardly stops to take a breath. It is like almost every verse begins with a connecting word or phrase like therefore or for, in preparing for a sermon or a lesson, we have a tendency to stop after a few verses in order that we can make application. But again, as Dr. Fee pointed out, that is not how an epistle was written. To be faithful to the most accurate exegesis, we must allow the text to speak for itself. And a shortcoming would be for us to take one word or one sentence and formulate a conclusion. We are searching for evidence to indicate the original intent of the author, who in this case is the Apostle Paul. As you see here in verse 29, Paul frames an obvious question for a Jew. Is God the God of Jews only, or is he also God of the Gentiles? In the previous verse of 28, it was wonderful news to the Jews that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. As a Jew hearing those words, they were wonderful news and a great relief regarding the demands of the law. But Paul is not letting up on his Jewish audience as he quickly asks a very pointed question to these pious Jews. Is God the God of the Gentiles also? And then in verse 30, he makes a resounding statement. Paul declares that the God who justifies the circumcision by faith also justifies the uncircumcised through faith. 
Let's look at verse 30 in all nine translations. Was Paul's use of the conjunction by and then the conjunction through just an accident? No, in fact, you see all nine translations include the two different conjunctions. The use of two different conjunctions is not contested. This is an important point that I made several times at the February 24, 2024 debate. I described a dividing line in redemptive history. The dividing line of redemptive history is, of course, the cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. As I explained at the debate, this dividing line of redemptive history is so evident in Paul's letters and in the writings of John. I will share in detail about this in session nine as we focus upon the harmony of two-part Romans with Paul's other writings. I look forward to sharing about this same dividing line as it is revealed in the Gospel of John as well. Paul is defining the same dividing line here in this verse 30 of Romans chapter 3. Do you see this? This is definitely not what some people claim as two-track salvation. You see what Paul is really delineating in this verse is before the resurrection and after the resurrection. It was the faithful Jews before Christ that had faith and hope over hundreds of years for a coming Messiah. We refer these faithful believers prior to the resurrection as Old Testament saints. Do you not believe in Old Testament saints? Of course, most of us do because we have the book of Hebrews. And we see in Hebrews 11, which provides us a list of the heroes of the faith. Jesus himself tells us in John 4, 22, that salvation is of the Jews. The point that Paul is making in verse 30 is a very important one because after Christ arose, we are saved through faith in a risen Savior. Prior to the resurrection of Christ, those who believed were of faith in anticipation of the long-awaited Messiah. And so Paul follows this declaration in verse 31, saying, we establish the law. When did Gentiles establish the law? That did not happen. And then in verse 1 of chapter 4, Paul asks, what shall we say then? That Abraham, our father, as pertained to the flesh, had found? This, of course, has to be Paul speaking as a Jewish descendant of Abraham as our father, part of the Jews. We will continue our count from session four. So this point of evidence per verse 30 will be number 32. Almost no one disagrees that Paul is writing to his fellow Jews here. Listen to John MacArthur explain this. Paul picks him not only because he transcends the ages and not only because he is the supreme example of faith in the Old Testament record, but because he was the favorite illustration the Jews used to prove salvation by works. So he really overturns their model of salvation. The majority of rabbis held that Abraham was the only righteous man of his generation, that he was the only truly righteous man of his generation, which remember now is pre-Israel, since he is the father of Israel, pre the giving of the law to Moses. So he stands alone as the emblem of righteousness, and the Jews taught that is why God chose him to be the father of his people. This is obvious evidence that Paul is writing to his fellow Jews. Paul writing, our forefather according to the flesh, is undeniable evidence that Paul is writing explicitly and separately to the Jews. And this is point of proof number 33. All of this proof before us, but some like my debate opponent, James White, insist that Paul is writing to all in Rome. As you recall, even John Piper said no. Per the clip we aired in the first session and also again in session four, John Piper emphatically declared that Paul wrote to the beloved and the called in Rome. Not everybody in Rome, but the called and the beloved. Look closer at this verse three. If Paul was writing in this section to the Gentiles, why did he keep going back to Abraham? Paul definitely continued to write separately to the Jews by quoting Genesis 15, six, that Abraham believed God and it was counted unto Abraham for righteousness. This is Paul emphasizing the point. Righteousness was not counted or imputed by the works of Abraham. It was the faith which was counted to Abraham for righteousness. Three pieces of evidence. Paul emphasizes 
the Old Testament promise in Genesis 4, 9 and 15, 6. Two, Paul's use of a personal example, our forefather according to the flesh. And number three, Paul could have used Gentile examples, but he exclusively uses Jewish examples. This again is another point of evidence that Paul is writing to the Jews. Now look with me at chapter 4, verses 6 through 13. In other countries, when people hear the name of George Washington and Abraham Lincoln, many automatically recognize that those names identify with the United States of America. In the same fashion, when Paul writes about Abraham and David, his audience knows he is referring to two of the great heroes of the Jewish faith. Abraham was known as the father of the Jewish faith, and David as one of the greatest kings to serve the Jewish people. As you see in these verses, God imputed righteousness to David without works, just as God had reckoned Abraham for righteousness. Paul's point to a Jew is that reckoning had nothing to do with their circumcision. You see in verse 13 that God says that the promise of Abraham would be heir of the world was not through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Paul is saying that the promised plan to the Jews was based on faith. So look closer at verse 6. Paul uses a prime example for the Jews, David, the great king of Israel. Number two, obviously David was esteemed greater to Jews than Gentiles. Now look closely at verses 14 through 22. Paul continues to remind the Jews to those who know the law. Now look at verses 14 through 16. The evidence is obvious. Paul is explaining this great truth to those who know the law. Second evidence is that Paul is not referring to just any law. Paul is referring to the law of the Jews, the Torah, as the law is capitalized. Thirdly, Paul is emphasizing the Torah. The Torah did not play a major role in the faith of Gentiles. We've discussed this. But as Paul states in the latter part of verse 16, but also for those, Paul is using those to refer to Gentiles who have the same type of faith as that of Abraham. These verses represent another substantial point of proof that Paul is writing directly and separately to his fellow Jews. We proceed with verses 423 through chapter 5, verse 1. Note in verse 24, as those who believe upon him, the him is obviously God. It is God who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. Evidence 1, this is a Jewish perspective because they worship God and had great hope for the coming Messiah. Evidence 2 is that Paul uses the first person pronoun, our, four times in verse 24 and 25. Paul described himself as a Jew of Jews and is writing to other Jews. Evidence 3, therefore, of chapter 5, verse 1, indicates a conclusion of the previous verses. So Paul is saying we have peace. Paul's use of the first person pronouns are consistent, substantiating that he maintained his same audience as his fellow Jews. Paul continues to identify with his Jewish audience. And this is point number 37. Before we proceed with chapters 5 and 6, you may have already noticed a pattern of a motif or an imagery intentionally used by an author as a tool to communicate. Have you made a list of words that Paul uses as he sets up this motif? If you did, I think your list would look something like this. And this is observation number four, Paul's use of words to set up this motif. In chapter five, we see hope, afflictions, perseverance, weak, shame, wrath. In chapter six, slave or slaves, master, obedience, free, freed. In chapter seven, bondage, captive, deliver. In chapter eight, slavery, fear, sufferings, free, groan or groanings, famine, hope, delivered, affliction, persecution and slaughter. What do all of these words have in common? Paul is obviously using the slave motif. And some will say, well, there were many slaves in Rome in that day. And some do claim as much as 30% of the population were slaves. But you see what this is really about is that Paul is speaking in the heart language of the Jews. It is the story of captivity and the exodus 
It is the story of the Jews escaping Egypt after 400 years. These are the word pictures of suffering, the groaning, the affliction that resonated mostly with the actual journey of the entire nation of the Jews. It was their story. It was and is their sad heritage. In today's world, it is like the word cancer. That one word resonates so much with so many people. It is painful just to mention the word. Many refer to it just as the C word. Paul intentionally used Exodus language of the Jews in these verses, and this is not a new observation. Many have made this point, and perhaps none more often than the highly published author N.T. Wright. And listen as he expounds upon this observation. Remember, in Romans 6, 7, and 8, Paul is telling the story of the Exodus. The slaves come through the water and find freedom, chapter 6. They arrive at Sinai and wrestle with the problem of Torah, chapter 7. And then in chapter 8, the sacrifice is offered, the temple, the tabernacle is constructed, the presence of God comes to dwell in the midst, and the people are led by God to their inheritance. This is an Exodus narrative. As a point to note, I do not agree with everything that N.T. Wright alludes to about Romans. And I am not claiming that he supports the two-part Romans position, at least as far as I know he does not yet. But I do think his observation about Exodus used by Paul is absolutely correct. And please put this in your notes as the overall observation number four. I will have one more overall observation a little bit later. Now let us look at verses two through six of chapter five. Again, note in verse two that Paul continues to write in the first person. Paul said, we have obtained our introduction. Verse three, the pronoun we again is used. And in verse five, it says within our hearts. Look at verses five and six. Five and six evidence. Paul mentions hope which describes the long-awaiting anticipation of the Messiah of the Jews. Evidence, too, is that while we were still weak at the right time is definitely a Jewish perspective. Gentiles were not the ones who waited in hope for the right time. This is absolutely proof Paul is separately writing to his fellow Jews. Looking now at verses 7 through 11, note in verse 8, Paul uses the pronoun us, and then in verse 9 uses the pronoun we. Look closer at verses 10 through 11. Evidence one, when Paul says, for while we were enemies, this is prior to the writing, the death of his son. This is definitely a Jewish perspective. The Jews are waiting for the Messiah. Evidence two is that Paul says, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. And then says in verse 11, we have now received the reconciliation. Paul is writing again from a Jewish perspective of the past. Again, Paul consistently used the pronoun we, identifying with his fellow Jews. This is point number 39. In verses 12 through 19, notice that Paul continued to look back as he alluded to Adam to Moses in verses 14. There are several major doctrines covered in this passage, but for the purpose of our task of identifying Paul's audience, we will move on. Let's take a closer look at verses 20 and 21. Here we see that Paul is explaining the role of the law, the Torah, because the word law is capitalized. This, of course, is Paul appealing to the Jews, the people of the Torah. The Gentiles were not the people who were keenly familiar with the Torah. And this is point number 40. Moving now to chapter 6, in verses 1 through 9, now we have the passage about abounding grace. And note the first person pronouns of we in verses 1, 2, 4, 5, 6, and 8. I mention this to remind us that Paul did not change his audience. Look closer at verses 6 through 9. Evidence 1, as pointed out earlier here in verse 6, Paul uses the metaphor that is very personal with the Jews. Slave. Evidence 2, in verse 9, when Paul exclaims, death no longer is master. This is very vivid and emotional language for Jews. Like when Israel fled from Egypt, this was a ringing, resonating reference for Jews. This is their heart language. Many Gentiles perhaps had been slaves, but not like an entire nation, not like the nation of Israel. This is another substantial point of proof 
Looking at verses 10 through 14, note the central message of verse 12. Do not let sin reign. Look particularly at verse 14. Evidence one is that when Paul goes into detail saying, sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under the law. This is definitely Paul writing to his fellow Jews. Gentiles were not known as having been under the law. This is Paul explaining to the believing Jews that they were under grace, no longer under the law. Paul is saying here they have a new master, similar to Israel fleeing from the master of Pharaoh of Egypt. No longer sin is your master. Paul is masterfully tying all this imagery together for his fellow Jews. In verses 15 through 23, this is where Paul repeats the words slaves several times. Notice how in verse 15, how Paul makes this contrast between being under the law versus under grace. Evidence one, Paul asks an obvious question for the Jews. Are we free to sin since we are no longer under the law? Of course not. It was the Jews who were no longer under the law, not Gentiles. In verses 17 and 18, we see that the Jews were the ones as a nation of Israel who had been slaves to the sin because they were under the law. Now they had a new master. Evidence three, and look at this in verse 17. You obeyed from the heart that pattern of teaching to which you were given. Obeyed from the heart is very significant language. Paul also wrote, you obeyed the pattern of teaching. Paul is referring to the past. Gentiles were not known for this. This is definitely the heritage of the Jews, not Gentiles. Evidence 4, verse 18, now the Jews are slaves to righteousness. Paul is carefully explaining this to his fellow Jews who had the heritage of slavery as a nation. Paul is saying, you are still slaves, but you have switched masters. All four of these represent another point of conclusive evidence that he's writing to the Jews. Verses 19 through 23, we see again, Paul is emphasizing a new master enslaved to God as expressed in verse 22. So we see Paul continues to remind the Jews of their slavery. And Paul states, you were free in regard to righteousness. Again, represents the actual pilgrimage of the Jews. Paul did not change his audience. Paul could have easily declared, you Gentiles are free in your righteousness. But Paul did not say that. This is additional evidence, again, who Paul is writing to. And now we come to chapter seven and look at the first three verses. Let us look closer at verse one in our nine translations. We see here as evidence, I am speaking to those who know the law. Did the Gentiles know the law? No. Who knew the law? Yes, of course, it was the Jews. This is another monumental benchmark in this solid chain of evidence. How could Paul have made it more clear? Notice in chapter 7 and 8, Paul uses the imagery or motif of law or court. And again, listen as N.T. Wright describes this imagery. In Romans 2 and Romans 8, we have, for the only time in Paul, justification spelt out in terms of the law court in which sinners are to their surprise to be declared in the right, and Gentiles, the ungodly, are declared to be children of Abraham, and these two things turn out to be intimately related. So Romans then sharply distinguishes between the future justification, which is in accordance with the totality of the life that has been lived, and present justification, what we normally think of as justification by faith, which is the anticipation of that final verdict when someone believes the gospel. It is true, gloriously true, that the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. But this is not because true believing is just the kind of activity that Jesus happens to like, but rather because that faith demonstrates that the Spirit has been at work through the gospel and that the person in question is in the Messiah, the Messiah who has himself already been vindicated by God. Thus, the verdict of present justification is held in place between two things, the death and resurrection of the Messiah in the solid past of God's covenant faithful act and the full and final justification in terms of resurrection in the future. 
Paul then explains present justification in Romans 3, 21 to 4, 25, in terms of the revelation of God's covenant faithfulness. God has done what he always promised to Abraham, namely to give him a global family who will inherit the world. And for that to happen, he had to deal with their sin. And that is what was done on the cross. The present verdict of in the right, which we hear gloriously when we believe, is thus also the radical application of the covenant promises. To get the whole picture, you have to have law, court, and covenant together. And that's what Paul gives you. We need the legal language and the in Christ language together. And that's what Paul gives us. And N.T. Wright is not the only one who points this imagery out. Do you see in verses 4 through 7 how this law court scene plays out? Who is released? Verses 6 and 7, we see, we have been released from the law. Obviously, one had to be under or captive to the law initially before one could be released from the law. To be old is to be of the past. This refers to the past of Israel. God's people under the law. Paul makes it clear. It was the law. I would not have come to know sin except through the law. This is Paul's personal and firsthand account as a Jew. This is more evidence, once again, that he's writing to the Jews. Looking at verses 8 through 14, this is Paul giving his personal testimony as a Jew. Paul declares he was sold into bondage. Who was sold? It was not all the Gentiles, it was Israel, all of the Jews. Paul is relating the old, painful, and agonizing story of his people, the Jews, being sold as slaves to the Egyptians. The brothers of Joseph sold him. Paul's Jewish audience knew exactly who Paul was referring to here. Looking at chapter 7, verse 15 through 8, 1, we see great doctrines are taught in these verses. But our task is to weigh the evidence indicating Paul's intended audience. Many of you may have realized in your overview observations that Paul shifted here to what we call a law or a court metaphor motif. How do we know? Look with me at the repeated words. These are some of the repeated words in chapter 8. Condemnation, condemned, law, groan or groanings, suffering, death. That is in contrast to hope, spirit, adoption. When we see the terms that Paul is repeating, we realize that using words like condemned and justified represent a setting of judgment or that of a law court even in Paul's day. This law court setting is why some refer to this passage as forensic or judicial. Paul leads us to a final verdict. Will the verdict result in such things as being the condemned, groaning, being separated, and death? Or will the final verdict and the sum total of Paul's continued teaching in these eight chapters be hope, love, newness in the spirit, and adoption? Paul is masterfully weaving this entire presentation of chapters 1 through 8 together. It is all connected, and again, there is no evidence that Paul changes his audience. So now let's take a closer look at chapter 8, and we'll start in verses 2 through 10. Let us focus upon verse 3 and 4 as we see. In verse 3, Paul explains what the law of the Jews could not do. In verse 4, Paul explains that the righteous requirements of the law be fulfilled in us, the Jews. Paul's consistency in using these first-person pronouns is undeniable. This provides point of proof number 48. This is an incredible amount of evidence that Paul is writing separately and exclusively to his fellow Jews. Now, as we look at verses 11 through 17, note that Paul definitely does not change his audience in these verses. Look closer at verse 15. Paul is defining his audience once again. You have not received a spirit of slavery, leading to fear again. By using the term again, Paul is making it clear he is speaking to those who had been in slavery as an entire nation, the people of Israel. But you have received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Paul using the term adoption because he is addressing his fellow Jews. To be adopted is to identify and rejoice in being included as God's children. 
Adoption is a term Paul used three times in Romans, and in each time he referred to the believing Jews. Check this out for yourself. You can look ahead at Romans 9 verse 4. We will go into detail about adoption later in our next session, but this is another point of proof. He's speaking to the Jews. Here we go into verses 18 through 23, and in these verses, Paul revisited his language of sufferings, longings, slavery, and even groanings. This was descriptive of the all-historic sufferings of the nation of Israel. But then we come to this glorious truth in verse 23. We ourselves having the first fruits of the Spirit. Paul continues to write in first person, and of course, it was the Jews on the day of Pentecost who were the first fruits of the Spirit. Paul is clearly defining Jews as the we. This entire passage represents the heart language of the we of the Jews. Secondly, eagerly waiting our adoption. It was the Jews who had longed for, for hundreds of years, were eagerly waiting in hope for the Messiah. This we in no fashion or definition represents the Gentiles. This is evidence beyond a reasonable doubt. Paul is writing to his fellow Jews, the first fruits of the Spirit. And Paul is not finished. Verses 24 through 27, for in hope we were saved. Paul relates that it was the we Jews who had longed, the we Jews who had hoped for, and the we Jews who long awaited the coming of the Messiah. Wow, like this is monumental evidence. Verse 27, he intercedes for the saints. Again, wow, this is the same called and beloved saints Paul defined in verses 1-7. And by the way, the original Hebrew word saints means holy ones. Through the years, by Jerome, it was later translated into the English word we know as saints. I'll explain more about this in an upcoming session. Paul uses the term saints or holy ones six times in this letter. In the meantime, these are the first fruits of the Spirit is definitely more proof. This is point 51. And now we go to verses 28 through 30. We introduce each of our sessions on two-part Romans with my debate opponent, James White, eloquently declaring that the golden chain of redemption within these verses 28 through 30, as Paul has written it here, cannot be broken. James White is correct, and I agree that this golden chain of redemption cannot be broken. Let us look at it here. For those who are called, this is the same called of chapter 1, verse 7. Just as John Piper emphasized, Paul has not changed his audience. Paul has consistently defined that his audience is none other than the Jews. The Jews whose forefather in the flesh was Abraham. The Jews who knew the law. The Jews who was the O man in chapter 2 and 3, as R.C. Sproul explained. The Jews who bear the name Jew. The Jews, the name of God who was blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. I'm going to say this slowly, but hear me very distinctly. We do not have the prerogative to change the audience. Let me say it again. We do not have the latitude, the discretion, or the prerogative to change the audience. Verse 30, he also called. Paul consistently referred to the beloved and the called as the faithful Jews throughout all of these first eight chapters. This is point number 52. Let's quickly look at the remaining verses. Looking at 31 through 34, in verse 32, Paul declares God delivered him over for us all. This is the same us. To prove otherwise, one must find at least one verse where Paul says we or you Gentiles. It is not to be found. Verse 33, who will bring a charge against God's elect? This is Paul defining the elect as the faithful Jews. Since Paul has not switched his audience. Verse 34, who intercedes for us? The us is the same us Paul has referred to throughout the entirety and continuous discourse of the first eight chapters. This is a point of proof 53. Looking at verses 35 through 39 as we close out chapter 8, the concluding verses we have the grand benediction and the grand summary of Paul concluding this entire discourse 
of the first eight chapters to his fellow Jews. Look at verse 36. In this verse, Paul leaves no doubt about whose affliction, turmoil, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or sword he was writing about. Paul quotes Psalm 44, verse 22, a worship song which was very familiar to his fellow Jews. And Paul is saying that the saints of the past, the Jews, had endured all manner of sufferings, but yet they were not separated from the love of God. Paul is reassuring his fellow Jews in Rome that such sufferings, even like being expelled from their own homes in Rome, had not separated them from the love of God. This was a great reminder of a wonderful truth in Paul's efforts to reconcile the Jewish believers with the Gentile believers in Rome. This is so convincing and compelling. How does anyone not see this? Paul is using the Jewish Psalm 44 to encourage his fellow Jews. This is point number 54. I see this as so amazing. This represents an abundance of astounding evidence. In fairness, did you happen to see any verses where Paul wrote in first or second person to the Gentiles? Someone might say, well, how about where Paul spoke about the uncircumcised? Well, yes, let's look verse 11. We see Paul described Abraham so that he might be the father of all who believe without being circumcised. But then Paul quickly clarifies by adding, that righteousness might be added to them. Paul did not say added to us. Paul said added to them. Paul referred to them as Gentiles. So our score is 54 to zero. Paul wrote the book of Romans in two parts. He wrote first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. He uses this very phrase three times in chapters one and two. Some of you will say, well, you have not proved Paul wrote Romans in two part fashion until you document that Paul wrote to the Gentiles in the last eight chapters. Yes, you are correct. And I look forward to our session six, our next session, as we will start to examine and weigh the evidence to prove that Paul changes his audience beginning in chapter nine. Paul wrote the latter eight chapters of the book of Romans to the Gentiles. Be prepared to be amazed. You do not want to miss our next session. If you could, please consider subscribing and do not miss any of the sessions. Please share this with your church friends and your family. This finding is so important. The golden chain of redemption cannot be broken. Do not forget, you can purchase Brent Lay's book for less than $10 on Amazon. A link is in the description box below. May you study to show yourself approved. Go and be good for real.